Hi everyone, welcome to Ask the Horse Live. I'm your host, Michelle Anderson, Digital Managing Editor of The Horse. Tonight, we're talking about Lyme disease in horses. Lyme disease is notoriously difficult to diagnose and has, or might not have, a myriad of vague, or maybe not so vague, clinical signs in horses. What do we know for sure? We know it's born, we know it can cause neurologic clinical signs, and, well, I'm gonna leave the rest up to Dr. Eric Swinebrod, uh, who is our expert tonight. He's from Newmarket India Atlantic Equine, a sport horse practice based in New Hampshire, and serving clients throughout New England, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and Florida. Welcome, Dr. Swinebrod. Thanks, Michelle. It's good to be here, and hi, everybody out there that's that's logged in, and thanks for your interest as well. Yeah. Uh, so you uh, have experience with this disease. Can you tell us about your experience and, and how you've come across it in your practice? Well, I, I, I did an internship in the residency and I did a surgery fellowship. So I've been in academia for a bit. When I was in my residency in Texas, it was internal medicine and, and lameness, which is unusual because usually lameness is with the surgery folks. Um, and the chief resident, who's a dear friend and just a, a brilliant woman who's out at Missouri, she was a Navy pilot first and now then went on to be an internist and a bacteriologist. She was from Tufts and she knew I was going to move up to the Northeast and, and suggested that if I could get people to just drop the S and call it Lyme disease and not Lyme's that we'd, that we'd actually be making a lot of headway and that sort of piqued my interest on what's going on with this thing. Moved up to yeah. New Hampshire, which I love and um, of course it's, it's sort of everywhere, at least serologically it's everywhere. And there's a, quite a controversy about it. And um, it is a fascinating organism. And even the tick life cycle is kind of fun if you're nerdy to follow along and, and see how this thing, this thing being the bug that's Lyme or Borrelia, um, Borrelia burgdorferi, um, how it actually coats itself and makes it more difficult for the species that it lives in to fight it off. And that's true of the horse. So just in general, the internists have an interest in medicine and I live in the Northeast. So there you go. So, uh, so you are boarded in internal medicine, correct? Boarded in internal medicine. I'm a, I'm a medicine specialist. There isn't per se a specialist in lameness, although that was the second half of my, my residency. And then I moonlighted in anesthesia and pain control uh, okay. to make ends meet, but no. Yeah. So I'm a specialist. In medicine. Yeah. And and then um, recently you've been involved in publications can, uh, regarding yes. Lyme. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. There is a, a yearly publication <clears throat> called the Consensus Statement. And it's produced by a group called the uh, um, people that are diplomats in the American College of Veterinary Internal Medicine, ACVIM, right? So it's the American College of Veterinary Internal Medicine. And these are all internal medicine specialists. And each year there's a small animal and large animal consensus statement where we get together and try our hardest <laughs> to come up with a consensus on a disease process. And those of us in sort of the Northeast, in the Midwest and in California have been asking for a while if, if we could do a large animal consensus or an equine consensus statement on um, Borrelia or Lyme disease. And so this year was the first year that the uh, internal medicine college acquiesced and said, sure, let's see what we know. And it was generated by, uh, many of you guys know the name Tom Divers, and Dr. Divers is at Cornell, and he and the uh, uh, brothers Chang, doctors Chang, Chang, and Divers, um, did the original research um, back in the 2000, around 2000, on Lyme disease in horses. So he was our, sort of our chief contact veterinarian. And then Internists from Pennsylvania, from California, um, from a number of vet schools. I mean, these are smart people, and it was intimidating at some point to 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 actually be online with them because they were some of my professors or the people I looked up to when I was coming up through the ranks as as a budding internist. So, so yes, we wrote the the consensus state, statement on Lyme disease, and then I was asked. Um, by a group out of Tufts disease, if I would put together a paper that was Lyme disease in sport horse practice. So Borreliosis, now Borreliosis is the big word for Lyme disease, so we could just call it Lyme disease. Um, and that publication is uh, in the veterinary clinics of North America. It comes out this August. Um, I just got the final proof 
back. Um, so next month there will be a small red book that comes out and many better than subscribe to it. It's, again, it's a quarterly book publication and I, I'm the sole author on that. So I've been uh, really fortunate in, in my job. You know, we uh, at the horse get to go to the big meetings that all, all you smart vets are at. And I've been in the room when there's been discussions about Lyme disease and consensus seems like a big place to get to <laughs> from sitting in those meetings. Um, and so, and I know I have a ton of questions about it. Um, you know, sitting in, in the room and, and listening to people talk about testing and clinical yeah. science. And we have a, a ton of questions that came in from our audience. We have a, a lot of people that registered for tonight's event Excellent. and they're, and they're joining us. I can see them popping into our group. Yeah. So uh, with that, I want to give everyone a quick a uh, review of our Ask the Horse Live format uh, so they know what to expect if it's our first time joining us. We're going to start with, with the questions that everyone submitted during registration. If you're listening live and you would like to ask a question or if you would like a clarification to one of the doctor's answers, uh, you can go ahead and send us that question uh, in the chat box. Uh, Erica Larson, our news editor, is reading those as they come in and will be forwarding them to me. Uh, for, for use in our event tonight. So with that, uh, we have a lot of ground to cover tonight, uh, so let's go ahead and get started. Our first question, Dr. Swainbrod, is from Heather in Alberta, Canada. Mm -hmm. And Heather, Heather says, as someone who has dealt with pulling ticks from horses since we moved to Southern Alberta, I'm interested in any signs or symptoms. So what are the clinical signs that we're looking for in horses? Okay, so here is, we could probably use the word consensus and controversy at this, yeah. at the same time. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to use as a, as a basis is the two articles we talked about, plus a little bit of what's kind of goes on in practice. Um, there are only three clinical um, symptoms or signs of Borreliosis or Lyme disease in the horse that we know are truly related to Lyme disease in the horse. And they are very simply a bumpy skin disease that looks like lymphoma, which yeah. is called pseudo lymphoma. And pseudo just means false. So it's false lymphoma. So where the tick attaches, sometimes you'll see these little strips of, of tissue that look like um, lymph, lymph tracts. Um, like somebody's put a little tiny straw or something long underneath or, or spaghetti underneath the skin. So one is lymphoma or pseudo lymphoma or bumpy skin is eye disease like moon blindness which is uveitis mm -hmm. and the third is a neurological disease now from the from the studies that we've done the research that's been done um, in infecting horses with Lyme disease that's it those are those are the only symptoms that we know are definitively caused by Lyme disease now those of you in the audience are going now wait a minute mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. because there are load, I think that's a good way to put it, I almost said it the wrong way, um, of symptoms and signs that we relate back to Lyme disease, stiffness, behavioral changes, um, girthiness, uh, oh my gosh, it gets blamed for everything up here. You know, your truck won't start in the cold morning and it's Lyme disease in this area. Yeah. So it's, it's difficult. But the most, the most common, the most common symptom that we get in the field, or we feel that we get from field practitioners is that stiffness and shifting leg lameness. Um, and so that probably should be on the list somewhere based on where we find the bug and we find the bug and for bug, you know, obviously I'm talking about Lyme or Borrelia um, in between the muscles along what they call the fascia uh, along the nerve endings. And then especially around the joint spaces in the synovial lining of joints. So you'd imagine that they'd be, the nerves would be irritable the muscles would ache and the joints would hurt. Um, and it's different in people and different in dogs. So we'll consider those as probable um, signs of Lyme disease, but they're not actually been proven. So is that lameness that we see, is that a neurologic lameness? No, it, it was, there were four cases out of Europe and I could find the paper, but I'm not sure anybody really did the care. Um, there was a report of four cases in Europe where they had what they call inflammation of the synovial lining or synovitis. 
Um, so you have a, a swelling, not a swelling, let's drop that one, uh, a pain that's around the joint space. So you're going to get that sort of, and it's in multiple joints. So almost like rheumatoid arthritis, you're going to get a, a shifting leg, multiple limb, multiple joint, hard to block out, weird lameness, um, and then a stiffness that goes on with it. The neuritis may be something more like a twitchy face. Um, if you've got nerves are are kind of ticked off, um, you're going to find that the the muscle that's associated with it may atrophy. So you might get some muscle atrophy. You might get some back pain. Um, if the those of you that have thoroughbreds that have had um, throat issues and have trouble breathing, you'll get the same thing with with the neurological form of Lyme disease. You'll get respiratory distress or a tough tough time breathing because they get sort of paralyzed in their throat. So, and then they get a little, the neurological ones will get a little bit uh, of uh, wobbliness or ataxia. So I've heard you say girthiness, which makes me think ulcers and yep. uveitis, that makes me think lepto. Yep, um, exactly. So, so how do you distinguish Lyme disease from other causes of similar clinical signs? The the hallmark that we came up with, and this this was actually a consensus between at least the the seven the seven authors in a consensus paper statement, is that, and we'll I'll say this a couple times through the the process, is that Lyme is on your rule out list or your list of differentials or things that you're thinking about when you look at a horse with certain clinical signs, but it's also the last thing you look at. So when we ask practitioners to try and diagnose Lyme disease, we ask them actually to try to rule out common issues um, that happen first. So you want a complete and thorough rule out of, of common differentials. And what that means is that you do everything you can to make sure that it's not EPM, to make sure that it's not uh, leptospirosis, to make sure it's not uh, just good old fashioned bone spavin. That's mm -hmm. causing, let's say, the the lameness. The neurological disease, they often, you know, how they often overlap. And I, I very much enjoy neurological disease because we we work on it very hard as internists, and it's not such a conundrum as when I was in general practice. Mm -hmm. So we 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 rule out EPM, we rule out West Nile virus, we rule out rabies if you're in Texas, because rabies is a is a as much of a mimicker of multiple diseases as Lyme diseases. You can come in with a horse that has a single leg lameness and it's actually rabies. Yeah. So you rule out everything else first and then you're stuck with Lyme as a, almost as a leftover, believe it or not. Hmm. So we have a question from uh, Miriam in Virginia and she wants to know if the clinical signs are similar to uh, periplasmosis. Yeah. I wonder if she means periplasmosis, which is Babesia, or if she means anaplasmosis. I I am not because, sure because so basically let's go with the two the two overlap in common ones which would be anaplasmosis and, and I'll talk about Babesia or periplasmosis at the end. Um, the hallmark of of what used to be called Ehrlichia equi, which is now called anaplasmosis phagocytophilia, believe it or not, and they they do this to confuse us all by changing <laughs> the names, um, is basically if you have a horse that has a fever, lethargy. Um, or depression. Now, depression is a state of mind, so you're going to have to tell me if your horse is depressed or if he's just lethargic, which is slow. You have a fever, uh, lethargic horse, it's got lower limb swelling. It's sort of puffy everywhere. That's more likely anaplasmosis than Lyme, um, especially if you run blood work and you find that the little, the little cells called platelets that help plug holes up so you don't bleed, if those are low, low platelets, um, which is called thrombocytopenia, so low platelets combined with a fever and, and lethargy or depression is going to be anaplasmosis. And the fever is profound with anaplasmosis. It's 103, 104 degrees. Rarely do you run into a Lyme disease horse unless you catch it in the acute phase or it's neurological that has a fever per se. Um, the other thing with things like Babesia, which is, a, again, another tick-borne disease, um, and anaplasmosis is when those little platelets get low, you start to have little tiny bleeding. So you get little red spots on your gums. And those are called petechial hemorrhages. So you'll find in some cases of anaplasmosis, uh, small red spots or petechial hemorrhages on your gums. Um, and those diseases, again, the anaplasmosis and babesiosis often lead to anemia more commonly than Lyme. So you're going to get 
breakdown of red cells, some anemia, and then the horse turns kind of yellow, gets jaundiced with um, pyro and pyroplasmosis and um, anaplasmosis and not so much Lyme. Does that cover so that? I, I do, I think so. Um, and we have another question from Stacy in Texas, and it has to do with uh, clinical signs as well. And she wants to know if uh, stumbling, and she said recently front and back, um, can that be a symptom of Lyme disease? So I, I hear stumbling and as a horse and I go, oh, well, front and maybe navicular or maybe yes. there's some arthritis going on. So what's the likelihood that stumbling that's new is related to, less, uh, to Lyme less disease? Than, at least in, in practice here in, in New England, or if I have horses when I go down to Florida or work on my own family's horses in Pennsylvania, which is why I have a Pennsylvania license because my sister and niece keep calling me and asking me to come down and, and treat things um i find that stumbling is less not as commonly a lyme disease differential you can still have it on the list remember we said you can just think lyme last which people are going to go oh come on it's so common well the serological tests are common but disease is probably only five percent of what we have serologically and it is expanding it is spreading it is the most commonly diagnosed tick-borne disease, at least in horses and probably in people in the United States. So again, if you think about our four principles, which is, is the risk there for it, did you examine it and you have something that's a, a Lyme sign, which would be a clinical exam, and we do, then you do that complete and thorough rule out of everything else first. And then you have to have laboratory confirmation of, the, of, of Lyme disease. So with stumbling, I would be looking at palmar or heel pain, mm -hmm. um, just like you said certainly in the front end and i would probably if he's stumbling all the way around and it's it's symmetrical um i would be looking at things like systemic diseases that are symmetrical lyme certainly could be one polysaccharide storage myopathy the muscle diseases where they, if they're not picking up their legs very well um and interesting enough epm if it's if it's asymmetrical would be on on the list. EPM is rarely, if ever, a symmetrical disease because the EPM protozoa doesn't move symmetrically through the spinal cord. It mm -hmm. just sort of, it stumbles its way through the spinal cord. And so you get a one-sided or, you know, an asymmetrical disease. So if it's just the forend, I would certainly be looking at navicular issues, heel pain issues, balance, just good old-fashioned hoof balance, mm -hmm. if you want to use that word. You know, do you, is this horse trimmed correctly? Is he in balance? Do you have the correct shoes on the horse? that sort of thing. Um, probably, again, would be my primary thought. And then I would go to Lyme if I rule out the primary issues. If we do nerve blocks, radiographs, and go, gee, it doesn't seem like it's it's navicular at all. And it's all four limbs and it's symmetrical. So it's probably not EPM. His vitamin E is in good shape. So he doesn't have one of the vitamin E diseases. Um, and the shoeing is in you know, is in great shape here, his or her feet, they're the right length, they're the right, the right medial lateral balance, the shoe's appropriate, it's set on correctly. Okay, well, let's look at, let's look at Lyme serology okay. and see. So we have a few questions that have come in from our live audience. Uh, Rodrigo wants to know what the best active ingredient is in a repellent to keep vectors like ticks yeah. away from equids. So so do you have a, a recommendation on, I, on what can work to keep these off of our horses to begin with? I, I've actually, on my horses in Pennsylvania, we've actually put the stuff called Sawyer Picadin on it, which is essentially an insect repellent made from a plant source that's in a in a cream, and you get it at most sporting goods stores, um, S-A-W-Y-E-R-P-I-C-O-D-I-N. Um, any of the pyrethrins work to a degree, but only as good as, um, only as good as they they work on us and it's hard yeah. to, there isn't a lot of things that repel ticks or fleas for that matter very well i mean you can you can get fancy and put dog flea collars around all four of your horse's ankles if they'll tolerate it <laughs> <laughs> i have a few horses that would be on the ceiling yeah if I did that to them. <laughs> I um, <do> too. <laughs> so i'm not sure there's going to be a few questions that you guys are going to throw at me that if you're not already disappointed by my <laughs> answers you're going to be because i i am a horse owner as well to a degree they're all my sisters and my nieces, which makes my life much easier. Um, 
And sometimes even as a specialist in internal medicine, we don't have a better answer than, than that. Mm -hmm. So the, the pyrethrins, and I think, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I thought there was something in the horse magazine that has, you guys have an article on, on prevention of, of ticks in the environment. Um, yeah, um, and, so our July issue actually has the feature article about Lyme disease, if people ah. um, want to look that up if they have uh, the print issue. Um, and then we also, um, Erica, who is t taking questions in, might be able to search a little bit for, for a recommendation um, um, on an article online that we can go ahead and pop in the chat, chat yeah, window I here. Uh, I, I thought that I sent this morning out to you guys a, a link. The CDC has a, has a website on it. Um, Consumer Reports, believe it or not, has a website on, or, and then um, um, up here, if you're in the Northeast, um, just go to the uh, Bangor News. They had online, they have an article on, on prevention. So we have a question from Tori in our live audience, and Tori says that Lyme disease is rare in her area, um, but her friend recently purchased a horse from Pennsylvania where she's heard Lyme disease is common. A few weeks after he arrived, he started losing weight and had a slight fever, and then has been acting a bit strange. Uh, <laughs> should he be tested for Lyme even though he's not living in an endemic area any longer? Um, he sh should, based on whatever, what the percentages are in Pennsylvania, um, he would likely retain a titer to Lyme even though he's moved. Again, fever is an unusual symptom for Lyme disease. So if you're gonna test for Lyme, you should probably test for anaplasmosis as well. Mm -hmm. um, acting weird, I, I have a hard time with that one. I, I guess I'd have to see mm -hmm. how he's working. Again, we wanna make sure that we look at the horse for other diseases, before we we jump right to Lyme disease. Um, so. We have a question from Jennifer in our live audience who is wondering where Lyme disease is most common. Is it more prevalent in certain geographical areas of the U.S. than others? And yeah. let's go ahead and talk about Canada too, because I think there's quite a yeah, few so. areas in Canada where it's. I I know we got a lot of questions about Lyme disease from our Canadian audience for tonight. Right. The the hot spots are going to be, especially where you find things changing, and as the as the world heats up, of course, then the Ixodes tick spreads, and if the Ixodes tick spreads, then then the tick diseases that carries like anaplasmosis are going to spread as well. The the three super hot spots are are the like the Michigan Michigan itself, the Upper Michigan Peninsula, the northeastern Minnesota, the northeastern United States, and we'll carry that all the way down to to the to the Maryland area on the East Coast. Um, so Maryland. Uh, Eastern Pennsylvania, through Connecticut, Rhode Island, uh, Massachusetts, um, you know, Old Lyme, Connecticut, of course, and then up into Southern Maine. And then there's a whole other population on the West Coast because the West Coast has the, the Western black-legged tick, which is Oxides, Ixides pacificus. Um, the scapularis, Ixides scapularis is on the East Coast. So where you don't particularly see it very frequently is Western Texas, New Mexico, um, Eastern Arizona, the Four Corners area, United States, Wyoming, Idaho, Colorado, that sort of area. Mm -hmm. um, southern, southern and southeastern Canada, and western Canada, because western Canada will have the western black-legged tick. So if y'all look where the ticks are, and there are a number of open access papers online, you can just look up uh, Ixodes prevalence in the United States and Canada, and there there are tons of great maps from again like the CDC and the uh, Entomological Journal Open Access Articles. And entomology is, again, bugs. My mom was an entomologist, so I spent my life trying to avoid bugs because my mom had a bunch of them. Um, uh, and uh, so if that's helpful, yeah, it's West Coast. Um, and then, you know, the thing is, is with, and that was a great question because horses travel, mm -hmm. especially now overseas, and it's a different, it is a different tick in Europe than it is in the United States. So the incidence and prevalence is different in Europe and the clinical signs can be somewhat different. Um, and it, it just, so it depends on where your ticks are. Florida, you know, everyone, there's no one left in 
New Hampshire in February. It's minus four for weeks on end. If you're not skiing, you go to Florida, Aiken, South Carolina, um, the Southern Pines in, in North Carolina. The horses go south, and all those horses are northeastern horses, so they carry quite a high Lyme titer. They don't carry, they're not going to be infectious or contagious for Borrelia, and they generally don't carry their ticks down um, in the winter, but you'll find an, the other the other hot spot, which is unusual, is Florida. Um, and again, most of that's because the horses the horses ship down that way. So, do all of these ticks carry Lyme? No, and I, that's a that's a great question. So, there are basically if it's not ixodes, if it's not a western black-legged tick or an eastern black-legged tick, um, it's not generally not going to carry the disease. Now, the the brown or the the dog tick and the Lone Star tick, if you happen to have an interest in grinding ticks up and looking for Lyme DNA or Borrelia DNA, you'll find you'll find it in those ticks. Um, so you can find Borrelia or Lyme in the, the uh, American dog tick and the, and the Lone Star tick. But they don't transmit it because those ticks are actually immunocompetent. Immunocompetent means your immune system is really well designed. And so they have it's a great name, Borrelia sidle. I love that name. So Borrelia is the bug lime. Sidle is like sidle to kill. So Borrelia sidle is the ability to kill Borrelia. They have Borrelia sidle proteins, um, and the tick red cells limit the infection so rapidly that the American dog tick and the Lone Star tick won't spread Lyme disease. Now, that's not to say that every Ixodes tick, every black-legged tick, that you find has Lyme in it. Um, some of them can feed their whole life cycle. They can feed as, as um, larvae, they can feed as nymphs, they can feed as adults and produce eggs and never have Lyme because they just haven't fed on a, on a mouse essentially or a horse that has Lyme disease. So they don't ever take it into their body. And not every black-legged tick that has Lyme in it is gonna transfer it to your horse when it bites. Just like you know, you can get bitten by a, a east a western diamondback rattlesnake in Texas. I had them on the ranch I lived on, and they don't necessarily inject venom into you when they bite. They may just be pissed off because you stepped on them and they bite you, but they don't want to waste their venom. And some of these ticks are not going to transmit Lyme to the horse, and we don't know exactly why they do that. I don't know. It's not something that's you know that the tick decides. It's going to do or the brelly's just hanging out in the tick and it doesn't want to go to a horse. Um, ticks are colder than horses, so there's a lot of changes that have to go on. Um, as soon as the blood hits the tick um, or gets into the tick, the lime's got to sort of convert its, its jacket to a different jacket to get into the horse because it's warmer than the tick body. So you think they, if they're warm weather, you know, Borrelia, they want to be in a horse. If they're cold weather Borrelia, they don't, but that's not exactly true. So not all, not all ticks carry it. The ticks that do, you carry it, not all of them transmit it. It can be quite hit or miss. Yeah, so you've touched on the answer to this question from Maureen in our live audience. She asks, where exactly do ticks pick up Lyme disease and spread it? The, the, the host, the main host are small, are small mammals. Um, it has been found in, in lizards, it has been found in birds, but for the most part, where a tick has the first chance of getting Lyme or Borrelia into its system is going to be, typically it's a white-footed mouse in the Northeast. And it's going to be the little tiny, 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 brand new, just hatched out of an egg larva tick that feeds specifically on small mammals. These are, these are very small and hard to see. Um, so the first chance they get it at picking up Lyme or Borrelia um, is going to be in a small mammal. Um, interestingly, go back to a second for the not every tick carries Lyme disease. There are a couple of papers out that have looked at other other insects, actually, um, not just arthropods like ticks, and they found actually Borrelia burgdorferi um, in mosquitoes. Um, but we've never validated, and don't go running back to your vet and going, oh, Eric said <laughs> ticks, ticks and mosquitoes 
transmit Lyme. There's never been a case that we know of in North America, Europe, or Asia where anything other than a tick has spread Lyme disease to a, a horse or a human. Um, but just in passing, you can you can find the DNA of the, of the bugs. And there's at least one or two good papers on it um, in the Culex pippins mosquito. Um, so, you know, to be to be determined, but I don't think so. We, we, it would be it would be more widespread than it is. Okay. We have a question from our live audience from Deborah, and Deborah wants to know if Lyme disease can cause or be involved in kidney failure in horses. So I think, isn't it? Um, don't dogs suffer from kidney failure yeah. related to Lyme, Lyme disease? Yeah, there's some there is some indication that that when you have a dog that has and I, I am not a dog tick I, I was a dog owner now I just have three cats but um, that there's a, re, a relationship between um, Borrelia and renal disease in dogs um, that has not not been the case in, in horses in the cases that um, Amy Johnson who is a fantastic internist at Penn which is a great school um, she wrote one of the the seminal papers on on neuroborreliosis, which is the the Lyme disease that causes such profound neurological disease. When those horses get super sick, we'll just leave it at super sick, toxic. Certainly, they can get dehydrated or have blood flow changes that lead to uh, renal or kidney disease. But it's not it's not the same as in the dogs. There doesn't seem to be a correlation between the two. And interestingly enough, when if you were to run, say, a SNAP test on a dog that's that's healthy that comes to the clinic, there is a consensus paper that was written by the small animal group a number of years ago that suggested that in a healthy dog that's SNAP positive, you don't uh, treat, you shouldn't, and you really shouldn't, treat for Lyme right off the bat. You should at least do a urinalysis and other blood work to make sure there isn't any kidney issues and talk about tick control and or, and or vaccination, which is another conundrum. So you've mentioned SNAP. So we have a question from uh, Nicole in our live audience, and mm -hmm. she wants to know what are the best diagnostic tests for Lyme? So I know there's hmm. different options. So. And how much time do we have? Uh, yeah. <laughs> so we're, okay. we're, we're, we have less than a so, half hour left, um, but I know this is, this is a big question, right? So my well, other than treating. Yeah, I have a number of philosophies. To me, the best test for Lyme is a negative test. Um, yes. <laughs> and in a, in a number of ways, that's not just kind of humorous, it's actually true. You sort of look at, there are four tests. There's a test that sort of um, looks at, they call it whole cell lysate or whole cell test. And that's if you were, if you were, had the ability to, to grind up a Lyme organism, this would test for it. And those are, some of you have heard of IFAT testing probably for EPM, um, which is indirect fluorescent antibody. Um, let's just call it I. I fat, and then ELISA, um, which is an you know, absorbent linked assay um, testing. So there's those two tests. There's the multiplex testing that I know those of us in the Northeast use quite a bit. Um, there's a good old fashioned thing called a Western blot. And then there's a SNAP, the IDEX C6 SNAP test. There isn't a gold standard test for Lyme in the horse or actually in the dog. Your general blood work, I think you all know, you've heard the word CBC or biochemical panel or profiles. Those are going to be non-specific. They may show inflammation, they may not. Those of you that have vets that have a stable lab, which is, looks at a, a protein called SAA or serum amyloid A, um, which can also, it's kind of clever. It, it can sort of differentiate between infection and inflammation. So the SAA or stable lab is kind of cool, but all that tells you is you have an infection. The most important thing Maybe there might be two things besides drop the S in Lyme. So it's Lyme and not Lyme's. A yeah. positive serological test, a positive serological test. So a blood test that looks at serum. Doesn't matter if it's Western blot, ELISA, IFAT, multiplex. Never, never say never, always avoid always. I'm going to say it. Never diagnoses Lyme disease. Never. A positive serological test confirms that you have antibodies against Borrelia or Lyme. So it basically confirms either exposure or infection and supports, if you have clinical signs, it supports disease, 
but those tests do not diagnose disease. If your horse does not have a clinical sign of Lyme disease that we've tried to define earlier, and you can try again, it does not have Lyme disease. I don't care how positive, I don't care if the ELISA, you run an ELISA, a Western blot, and you, and you paid $50 for a consult from a horse whisperer on the phone, and, and he or she said, yes, your horse says it has Lyme disease. It does not have Lyme disease if it doesn't have a clinical sign. And sometimes um, the best test that your vet can run is the one that they're most comfortable on. It's unusual, unless you have the eye disease, the uveitis, um, or spinal cord disease, it's unusual to ever be able to culture or find the DNA of Borrelia in your body because it's in such a small amount. Um, when ticks bite, they don't, they don't put, you know, four liters of, of lime into you. They put minute amounts of this bug, and that's enough to, to set your immune system off. So each test has its own positive and negative uh, attributes. And the thing I will say is if you run a test like a SNAP test uh, or... Uh, an IFAT test, you need to, if those are positive, those are sort of screening tests. So think about the IFAT and the SNAP. If those are positive, then you really need to run a Western blot or a multiplex test to, to back it up. Um, and the other thing is don't forget that there's a lag time between when your tick bites your horse and when they produce antibodies. And it's around three weeks. Um, and so if you, if you find a tick on your horse and you test immediately, the antibodies that you're getting aren't from that tick, they're from something that happened earlier. And some of those antibodies can last quite a while. Um, and they can be, I'm sorry, I mean, they can also come up when your horse doesn't have Lyme. They can, you know, there are false positives and false negatives. So I'm not gonna be able to tell you other than saying a negative test is the best test, um, to give you the specific test that's the best to use. On this coast where I am, I like the Cornell Multiplex. I'm used to running it. Um, the Western Blot's a pretty good test. Um, but there isn't one that's a that's a gold standard. If I do have neurological disease or I haven't had a case of uveitis, but you can, oftentimes you lose the eye, you have to take it out. You can use PCR to look for the DNA of the bug or look for the bug itself by, by culture if it's, again, neurological or, or ocular. Um, one of the benefits of doing a Western blot or the multiplex is that they can differentiate between vaccines and, to a degree, between vaccines and infection, where the IFAT and the SNAP do not, per se. Um, so it would be nice if they, if the feedback from the audience was like, yeah, we understand, or if I just confuse the issue. Well, we do have a question from Nancy in our live audience, and I think I think you've answered it, uh, but maybe we, we can give her uh, the, the boiled down answer. She wants to know if my horse tests positive for one of the Lyme antibodies, does it mean that she has had the disease or perhaps she was just exposed to it? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. So thanks, Nancy, for, because I think when I start this off, I should say there's an, a difference between exposure, infection, and infection and disease. With Lyme, if you're exposed, like you have a tick bite you, the blood goes into the tick, the blood comes out of it, the saliva comes out of the tick and the Lyme comes with it, um, you're pretty much infected. And infection is just presence of the organism in your system. Disease is what your body does to react to that organism to try to get rid of it, which gives you the clinical signs that we don't have a consensus on for what is Lyme disease. So, Anytime, again, I go back to saying a positive serological test, whether it's Western blot, ELISA, multiplex, just confirms that your horse has or has had Lyme disease in its bloodstream at some point in time. It does not tell you they have Lyme disease, and especially, again, if they don't have Lyme signs, they do not have Lyme disease if they have a positive test. The test that she might be thinking of, is, which is... Um, interesting is that multiplex test because they give you an outer surface protein and that's the jacket that the Lyme disease carries. When it's in the tick, it has a, a coating that's called OSP-A or OS, outer, outer surface protein, which is OSP, so we'll just call it OSP, OSP-A. And it sits in the tick's 
gut or mid gut and it's very happy with its little lightweight windbreaker jacket on well actually it's going to be a heavier jacket the tick's colder so it's got a nice heavy jacket on let's say as soon as blood comes into that tick it warms the the borrelia up and it's got to take its ospa or ospa jacket off the heavy jacket comes off and now it's got this nice little camouflage light windbreaker called osp c that allows it to get into the horse um, and therefore infect the horse now once it's been in the horse a while it gets acclimated like when i go down to florida to see my significant others a pa down there and we'll do the horse work within a couple of weeks i have sort of thinner blood and i'm wearing thinner clothing and that would be what they call osp or ospf and that comes in maybe five to eight five weeks to two months after the the borrelia is in the horse so when you run this multiplex test, they give you a number for OSP-A, OSP-C, and OSP-F. And the thought process is if your OSP-F is up and your OSP-C is down, then it's more chronic than if your OSP-C is high and your F, which again is the, I've gotten used to Florida, taking everything off, that's the OSP-F. OSP-C is the jacket that you wear, the light weight jacket as you get in. Um, OSP-A is going to be for vaccines for the most part. Um, or in, in maybe some more chronic diseases. About 5% of the horses that aren't vaccinated will have an OSP-A titer. The one thing I will tell you from an opinion standpoint is if I have a horse that, even though we've, we've only delineated, again, the skin disease that looks like they've got kind of lymph cancer, the uveitis or the neuro signs, if I have a horse that I've looked at it and I can't figure it out, I've, I've done my good lameness exam, I've, I can't get it blocked. It seems like it's shifting. It's multiple legs, there might be some muscle. If I run a titer and this horse is not vaccinated and it has an increased OSP-A and OSP-C, I'm gonna treat it. Um, because I think that might be as close to significant as I can get. Now, the OSPF titers, and I think it was Nancy that asked the question. That one is, it's fascinating because if you're like me and you're out there as an internist and you have clients that every once in a while will go, yeah, I'll, you know, I'll spend the money if, if you do it at cost and I do this and we're out pulling a Coggins test. I might pull a Lyme disease test. Oh, I said that wrong. Look at me. Holy cow. <laughs> I might pull Lyme serology to see if there's an exposure or infection. And sometimes I hate to do that because if the, the minimum of, for an OSP F to be positive is, is about 1200, 12, 1250. So 1,250 is considered positive. I go out and I see Sue's horse up the road. Um, and this is the horse I actually did this on. Nice warm blood. He hunts, um, lives in New England, right? He's in New Hampshire. Every once in a while, I'll go down to, to uh, Aiken or something. Nothing wrong. He, this horse is not lame. He's not girthy. He's not got uveitis. He's got not, not got neuroborreliosis. He doesn't have pseudolymphoma. This horse is normal. Clinically, this horse is normal. It does not have a disease. It's Coggins negative. I pulled a lime on it, and my OSP F titer was 15,000. Now, 1250 is positive. <laughs> and so, did I treat it? Of course not. It doesn't have Lyme disease. It just has a titer. The other thing that I want to make very clear on this, and I, because I hear this quite a bit, along with, let's go back to, give me just a moment on this one. Let's go back to my saying this again, so y'all remember this. A positive serological test does not, it confirms Borrelia infection, or previous infection, and supports a diagnosis of Lyme disease if they have clinical signs. These tests do not confirm or diagnose Lyme disease ever on their own. The other thing is that Borrelia is not a specific pathogen, as opposed to Salmonella, if you know that word, or Clostridium or Potomac horse fever, or rabies, or something like that. These organisms are not built to be a disease-producing organism per se. What happens is the horse reacts to the jacket, the coat, the coating that's on a Borrelia bug when it gets into the body and into tissues. So the clinical signs of disease and the response to the serologic response to Borrelia is a specific reaction of your horse to that bug. So when I hear a client go, 
my horse had Lyme disease because my vet tested the horse and he or she said that's the highest titer they've ever seen. That means nothing. Because if, if OSPC is positive at 1,000, a horse that has a 1,001 titer may be sicker than a horse that has a 10,000 titer. It depends on the response that the horse has to the bug. There's no linear correlation between how high your titer is and how diseased or sick your horse is. So this horse has a 15,000 OSPF titer. Again, 1,250 is considered positive, 15,000. Does it matter? No, that's not any more positive than 1,251. And just because it's positive doesn't mean it has Lyme disease. It just has had or has Borrelia in its system. So you, you've mentioned vaccines. And we have a question from Cynthia in our live audience, and she wants to know what is the status of an equine vaccine for Lyme, and does the dog vaccine seem to be beneficial to use in horses in endemic areas? So can you explain a little bit about this dog vaccine sure. and why horse people might wonder about it, and then where where we might be uh, on an equine-specific yeah. vaccine? So there are a, a number of, of uh, vaccines available for dogs um, and they're made by Boringer, Muriel, Merck, and Zoetis. So, and they're all a little bit different. One's called Recombitec Lyme, that's the Muriel vaccine. Um, Zoetis has two, they have Lyme Vax and they have a new one called Vanguard CR, which we should talk about. Um, and then um, there's Novavax Lyme and Duramune Lyme. Some of you guys might Y'all might have vaccinated your horses and you've heard of these. Um, the, the Lyme Vax, the Novabec Lyme, and the Duramune Lyme are, are, are basically bound up Borrelia. Um, the Recombitec, which is Muriel, and this Vanguard Lyme, um, those are recombinant DNA vaccines. They're subunit vaccines. So the Recombitec Lyme is an OSP-A vaccine. The Vanguard Lyme is an OSP-A and a chimeric or multiple OSP-C vaccine. This is the newest vaccine that's out, and it really piqued my interest. Um, they are all licensed for dogs. So if you, when we talk about pros and cons, um, the, we'll start with the pro, is they likely do protect your horse from infection with Lyme disease if they're exposed, if you have the vaccine at the right timing. Um, the con is they're off label, so there's liability issues if your veterinarian injects your horse and it has a seizure, or ends up getting an infection, which is not the vaccine's fault per se, maybe a drug and some, some skin bugs. It's hard to defend that in a court of law because, again, they're, they are extra label. They're off label vaccine use. They're not labeled, they're not licensed or labeled for horses. If you look at the consensus paper statement, which is again, the seven internal medicine specialists writing for the American College of Inter Internal Medicine, we did not as a consensus group um, list how to vaccinate your horse for Lyme. As a practitioner, not as an internist, I stuck my neck out on the, the VCNA, the Vet Clinics of North America paper and said, this is how I think we should start to vaccinate horses. And the only reason I did that is because vaccine use is all over the place. Some use two mils, some use one mil, some go sub-Q, some go intramuscular, some do two vaccines at the beginning, some do three vaccines at the beginning, some do it yearly, some do it twice a year. The one thing if you, if you and, and I can't get into these guys that I know on, online, um, the plausible deniability <laughs> is, is their forte. Um, even once a year, it seems like if you have an endemic problem, it, endemic means it's, it's in the area and it's prevalent in the area, that they seem to have less, they feel like they have less of an issue. But since we don't exactly know what the signs of or symptoms of Lyme disease is in the field per se, it's hard to say what, what you're fixing. Um, that said, they get pretty good antibody levels. Um, and the antibody levels that they get fall off at about five months. So you can use a dog vaccine in a horse. Um, 
And if it's got an adjuvant, it goes I am and an adjuvant, something like aluminum or some other some other particle that you put in the vaccine because the body doesn't really care if it's a killed whole cell. If it's a dead lime, it doesn't react to it. And we're not using live lime in them. So you need something to to go, hey, I'm here. Hello. And that's an adjuvant. The recombinant vaccines don't use adjuvants. Um, they are actually the antigen that produces the, the antibody of the OSP, the OSP, outer surface protein A, and outer surface protein C. They're fascinating because if you give a horse a vaccine that's non-adjuvanted, don't do this with one of those whole killed cell vaccines, like don't use Duramune, Novavax, or Limevax sub-Q. But if you use the Vanguard or the Recombitec, you put that little sucker sub-Q and the horse has so many little processing cells in that area, more than they do in the deep muscle, that they seem to have a better response to it, which is why we're kind of excited about this OSPA and OSPC um, vaccine that Zoetis has coming out called Vanguard Lyme, because there's a possibility that that one will give a really good immune response to what we want, which is OSPA and OSPC. Um, and have a reasonable half-life in the, in the horse. They, they being the pharmaceutical companies, it is enough of an issue now that there is profit in equine Lyme vaccinations. And from my contact to the veterinarians that I know that work for these companies like Zoetis and um, Oranger Ingerheim and stuff like that, they certainly are looking at labeling which will cost them a few million dollars, taking this Vanguard, say, CR Lyme or the, the uh, Duramune Lyme, which is Boringer, and labeling it for horses. So I think we're going to get a horse vaccine at some point. I don't know when. The dog vaccine is uh, effective. Uh, I have a way that I like to do it, which is use the recombinant DNA. I go sub-Q. I give a three-shot initial series, just like we do for the FEI. When I work for FEI shows, you give it between 21 and 92 days apart. The first vaccine goes in, basically two to three months later, the second vaccine goes in. Four months after that, the third vaccine goes in. And then twice a year I vaccinate um, if the owner wants to vaccinate. It's interesting to run a multiplex test first to see what your OSPA or OSPA is. Um, vaccinate and after the third vaccine, run it again to see if you get an increase in OSPA because that's what you're vaccinating with, don't forget. So there should be a response to that um, antigen and the, the horse should make OSPE, um, essentially antibodies to OSPE, sorry. Um, and that's where the recombinant OSPE, OSPE, the Vanguard line is interesting because it gives you that, that C molecule too, which I think is important because not, not all the ticks that are, that are out there when they transmit Lyme, not all the Lyme bugs in the tick are or OSP A, there's some OSP C, and that's a whole different. They both they have multiple jackets, so if that helps. So yes, there is a horse vaccine somewhere out there um, coming down the pike. It just depends on when they decide to to market it. Um, there is ongoing research that I know little about, but know it's going on here and in Europe to look at when they vaccinate, how much do they use, um, how do they give it, is it sub -Q or I am, and then. Um, how long do the antibodies last? This is, they've got that figured out. I think we'll be good. In the meantime, if you want to use the dog vaccine, go right ahead. Um, and you can either email me and say, how would you do it if your vet, your vet may have a protocol that they use? I like the initial three shot, three vaccine series followed by, since we do know the antibodies fall off at five months, then it makes some sense to do it twice a year um, and try to time it around when ticks are out. So we have about five minutes left, and so I have a couple questions that I wanted to get to. Maybe okay. we can do a rapid fire on a couple of these, and then I okay. want to hit, um, hit treatment uh, before we close. So Sherry in Connecticut wants to know if you recommend having testing done annually in areas that have Lyme. I don't, because the, ser the serological prevalence is so high, you're going to be positive. Again, a negative test. Remember I said a negative test is my favorite. Well, that's probably because it's more significant. Okay. Of course, um, the predictive value is better if it's negative, but no. And do not, there's no sense in pulling either EPM or Lyme on a purchase exam. Okay. Because you're, I don't care what signs a horse has. It just, it isn't, 
it's not predictive of disease at all. And you may pass on a very nice horse because you did that. And it's just not recommended by the internal medicine group to test for Lyme or, or EPM at a purchase exam. Uh, yeah, Juliet in New York wants to know if she should test for Lyme if her horse isn't sy symptomatic but has had several ticks pulled off of him. Um, it would be interesting three to four weeks out to, or to test him now if you just pulled the tick off and then three or four weeks later to see if he seroconverts. Same, same thing there. Remember, serological tests, they test for infection or exposure. They don't diagnose disease. If your horse doesn't have a clinical sign, it doesn't have Lyme disease. So if if Juliet's horse has, even if it has an OSPC test, that's positive. If it doesn't have a clinical sign of disease, there's no sense in treating it because you're going to be over treating normal horses. Um, so no, I, I guess you know you have to you have to give me a clinical sign that says my horse has Lyme disease, and then we can test it. Or if you're just interested to see what a background titer is and how it changes, because these things will change from from test to test and year to year, which is a whole nother hour of you know, your test might be equivocal today, but running the same the same blood two weeks later, it might be positive because it's gone up 10 points. So test, tests aren't so black and white as, as we make them out to be. We have a question from Susan in our live audience who wants to know if a horse has had Lyme disease in the past, would you vaccinate for it in the future? Sure. You, if it, that's, again, if, if it had Lyme disease in the past and it was an emotional roller coaster and difficult to treat. Run a titer on the horse now to make sure it doesn't have already have, say, a high titer. Um, vaccinate it and then check the titers again. Um, it's that's a that's a personal decision. I I don't vaccinate my horses for Lyme. Um, I didn't vaccinate my dog for Lyme when we used to go out and mess. I remember one day I pulled 130 ticks off him. I counted because you know our internet star we're so anal yeah. dependent. I counted. He had 130 ticks after we were. We were chasing pheasants around Massachusetts and um and he had a fever about four or five days later I just threw on toxicycline <laughs> for a week and the fever went away and I stopped and I never tested him for Lyme so I'm a terribly bad owner um, <laughs> but he never had any clinical signs of disease he died of cancer the poor guy but, um yeah so we have Lori in Pennsylvania wants to know about uh, doxycycline. So, are there any treatments beyond that? So, can you explain uh, in one minute <laughs> yeah. what uh, we we might end up going over a little bit? Um, but sure. uh, what um, what is the treatment option, and how likely is it uh, that the horse will recover with treatment? Um, it is a very individual thing. You, it's hard with the. If you look at the original, so let's go back. What can you treat it with? Well, you can treat it with the. Tetracycline. So you're looking at oxytetracycline IV. Um, there are some uh, bird tetracycline powders that some clinics will use, but they're not well absorbed. Um, they may feel like get, they get a better treatment with it, but oral tetracycline is not recommended by the internal medicine group. And I'm, I just don't think it works that well. So tetracycline or oxytetracycline IV is an excellent choice. Um, and then you have the oral tetracyclines. You have doxycycline and minocycline. Um, Ceftiafur, cephalosporins are actually quite effective as well. So there you're looking at Naxel and Exceed, and Exceed's the intramuscular um, antibiotic. Uh, penicillin, which comes in a sodium and potassium IV form, as well as uh, PPG or procaine penicillin G, which is the IM form. So you can do penicillin IV or penicillin IM. You can do cephalosporins IV or intramuscular with the Naxel and Exceed. You can do oxytetracycline IV doxycycline and minocycline orally. And that's kind of it. Um, the only time experimentally that veterinarians were able to knock the titer down and keep it down was using oxytetracycline in a relatively acute case. And that's the, the research again at, that doctors Chang and divers did at Cornell. Um, it was 100% effective prior to chronic exposure in these experimentally um, exposed horses. If you look at their paper, and they only had four horses in each group, the doxycycline group that they gave, the titers dropped off, and, and three or four, 75% of the horses had a positive titer four months after they treated it. So here's one where you give doxycycline, the titer drops, comes back off. They also use Nexcel, 
and 50% of those came back up to a positive titer four months later. Um, so when you get into these more chronic infections or the horse was, was infected and not isn't anymore but has antibodies to it, it's hard to change the titer. Um, I just, you know, if I have a horse that's, I, I don't get my OSPF titers to fall off like they, I know Cornell, I think sometimes with their dogs, you can watch the OSPF titer fall. That said, if you think your horse has Lyme disease and you put it on doxycycline and you get within a, a couple of weeks an immediately drop off of the C titer or the F, the C and F titers, then, then maybe you're doing some good. But don't be surprised four months later if you, or five months later if you test it, it's positive. And for gosh sakes, if five or six months later it doesn't have a clinical sign of disease, don't pull a titer and treat it because he's got chronic Lyme disease. He doesn't have chronic Lyme disease. He's got a persistent titer, which may mean that the bug's there and he's infected, or it just may be that he has a titer to it. So experimentally, the, the cephalofurs, the exceed and that cell, um, were a bit better than the oral doxycycline and minocycline. And by far the best treatment was oxytetracycline IV in an acute case. Now, if I have, I know it's two after, but if I could just have a minute. Absolutely. Do doxycycline, more than minocycline, or the, the, they're very similar. Doxycycline has better penetration of a joint. Minocycline has better penetration for neurological disease and ocular disease, but I don't think it's significant enough that you can't interchange them. The interesting thing about doxycycline specifically and minocycline to a degree is that they are brilliant anti-inflammatory agents for joints because they bind, especially doxycycline, it binds zinc. And zinc is used as part of a molecule that's called MMP. And MMP is just a molecule that breaks down joint protein. I won't even say what it is. We're just going to call it MMP. And it uses zinc in its in its production, and it gets into a joint, and it just wants to destroy the, the joint cartilage and give you arthritis or make your arthritis worse. Doxycycline binds zinc. It blocks MMP directly and indirectly, and it is a wicked good anti-inflammatory to the point where if your horse is a bit old and it's a hunter and it's not moving well, and you're on some Prevox and you've done your proper joint injections or your IRAP or whatever biologic you want, if you toss that horse on a little bit of doxycycline, it's going to get sounder. And I mean less than, not the, not the 40 or 50 tabs a day, but 10 to 15 tabs twice a day for five days, every other day for five days, every third day for five treatments. And you'll find that, and this protocol comes from some, some fantastically brilliant pets out at Colorado State. Um, and now at Cornell, where uh, Dr. Lisa Fortier, I believe, is, um, it'll make horses sounder, even though it's doxycycline is only about 17% available to the horse. When you give doxycycline to a horse orally, it's got a what they call a 17 around the 17% bioavailability, which means only 17% of it gets into the bloodstream. Um, so if you have a creaky old horse and you think it's got multiple viruses and you gosh, it's got an OSPF titer, I'm going to put it on doxy and it gets sounder. That doesn't mean your horse had Lyme disease. It may just mean that your horse has arthritis and you've treated it with doxycycline. So point in case, we may have, you know, you may be able to give them five tablets every day of doxy and watch them get, get sounder. So there's a benefit to using doxycycline and to a degree minocycline in, in the horse that's got creaky joint disease and may or may not have Lyme is the fact that you're going to make them happier because it's a joint anti-inflammatory. But again, going back to the research, the only thing that in a fairly acute case, let's say your C titer is up for the first time would be oxytetracycline IV. Um, but don't forget about exceeding the XL. If your horse doesn't like to eat uh, its medications and the medications aren't cheap, you can do the exceed because remember, it's, that's an IM dose that goes at day zero, day four, and day 10. And then you can hang it out a week to 17 and maybe 24 days and treat the horse for a month with essentially Four, four shots, zero, four, 10, and 17 might get you might get you out that way. Now, I hate IM shots because I used to get allergy shots as a kid, so I'd much rather take Doxy, but um, <laughs> you know, penicillin is, a, is effective um, and it does come in an IV form. It's hard to maintain catheters sometimes out, outside uh, 
Um, but for uncomplicated cases, if you've got, and I've never seen a case of pseudolymphoma, so if you have one, send me a picture, because um, you might have her from the article. Or you've got some anecdotal behavioral horse case. Um, you've done your four principles. You know there was risk. You've you've done a good clinical exam. You've ruled out everything else. You have uh, clinical signs of Lyme disease. You've got serology that's positive. You're fine using either doxycycline or minocycline. If you think it's a joint thing, maybe you go with, okay, I'll, I'll use doxy because maybe it's better absorbed into a joint. And then anti-inflammatories are a nice thing. This Prevacox, you doesn't kill every horse you give it to. It's been a good uh, general NSAID for, for years. Um, just more of us are using sort of the furacoxid, the equioxin, yeah. that sort of thing. So those are the antibiotics you can use. We don't have one that's perfect yet. Okay. Well, with with that, we are unfortunately out of time. Uh, I want to thank you, Dr. Uh, Swinerod, for joining us and for answering all, all of these questions. We had an, a nice big audience tonight. Um, and thank you to everyone who was listening, who sent in questions during registration and also during the live event. If you are still logged on, you can see uh, that Jennifer has, our producer has uh, listed links to some of those articles that uh, Dr. Swinebrod had mentioned earlier, uh, as well as some other resources that we have on thehorse.com. I want to thank everyone for joining us tonight, and I hope that you can join us next uh, next month when we're going to be talking about botulism. Until then, from all of us at the horse, I hope you have a great night.